This podcast is sponsored by Tusk, a continuity of business solution for industries that struggle with traditional banking. Check them out on the web at tusk.network. The Rob McNeely Program is the nexus of cryptocurrency, blockchain technology, and entrepreneurship. Now, welcome to the program. Okay, well, welcome to the show. I am Rob McNeely, and this is robmcneely.com. And we today um, have a great guest in, uh, well, not technically in studio. Um, on the line today, I'm talking to Calvin Waite. He is the CEO of coinbook.com, which is a brand new cryptocurrency exchange to come on the market. Um, yeah, I know there's lots of exchanges out there, but this one is kind of different. And I think it's going to be important that you listen up to this audio and video about this. So welcome to the show, Calvin. How are you today? I'm doing pretty well. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me, man. Well, hey, I've met you a bunch of times and, and you're local to us here in Utah. So that's a thumbs up. Um, you know, the, the cryptocurrency exchange world is kind of like almost like a minefield these days. There's been so many exit exchanges, so many hacks, so many, um, you know, offshore DEXs, anonymous cryptocurrency exchanges here and there. And, um, you know, as a, not only as someone who's involved with a cryptocurrency project, but as a cryptocurrency investor, it's scary to think about where we're putting our crypto, where, who we're doing business with as far as exchanges. Um, so before we, we get into why Coinbook is different, and I believe it is, um, uh -huh. can you tell the, the audience and the listeners a little bit about yourself? How did you get involved? What's your background? Um, what got you into cryptocurrency? So um, it'd be nearing the end of uh, 2012, I had a friend named Nate Davis, that essentially he knew I was, I, I liked to invest. He knew that I liked to mess around with markets and we had created some, I, I messed around with foreign exchange markets and created some automated trading strategies and I just kind of messed around with things, did some stock trading and options trading. And he said, hey, you know, I, I've, I've come across something called a Bitcoin and I've been mining these with my, my laptop and I've been selling these for like five, like for $5. When, this must have been a while ago because you can't really mine Bitcoin with a laptop. So you really <laughs> days yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I was like, huh. And he's like, yeah, I've made like 400 bucks. I'm like, wow, that's weird. So what on earth is a Bitcoin? And he said, well, it's a digital currency. And, and in my mind, I was thinking, well, I don't see how that's a big deal because you can copy and paste anything digital. So right. why, you know, I don't, I don't see how this could hold its value. You know, I'm just thinking from a, from an asset standpoint that here you've got a digital asset that how could that be worth anything? And he said, yeah, I mean, it's, it's worth more than $5 right now. And I seriously, my mouth dropped wide open and I was like, you're kidding me. You're telling me that there's a digital currency that's worth more than a dollar. Like that just blew my mind that it would be worth more than a dollar. It, it still blows my mind. <laughs> yeah. So from, from me, me and my market background, you know, how do you value a company and, and, and what is the general public and the world's risk assessment of a company worth? It's what their stock trades for. It's their market cap. And when he tells me that there's a digital currency that has convinced the world on, on aggregate that it's worth more than a dollar, that speaks volumes to me about security, about utility, about um, its future. Confidence. Yeah, gave me a ton of confidence. And I was like, well, wait a sec. How, how did they get around the copy and paste issue? And he's like, well, they fixed it and there will only be 21 million. It's part of the software. But the cool thing is, is it'll never be like, it's, it can't be taken down. It's not centralized anywhere. And I was just mind blown. And right then, like seriously, 10 minutes into our conversation, I was like, well, how do I get some? <laughs> and I bought my first 10 Bitcoins from him. And they, at the time, they were trading for twelve dollars and fifty cents each. The good old days. And then I said, "Well, you know what? I've got one hundred fifty bucks." He's like, "Yeah, you just open an account on Empty Gox," and he kind of blew my mind with all the technical stuff that I just didn't understand. And he's like, and "I'm like, well, I'll just pay you premium. I just want ten of them. Here's one hundred fifty bucks. Um, how do I do this? You know?" So he opened an account on Empty Gox and transferred them in there for me. <laughs> And that's how, that's how I got introduced to Bitcoin. 
Yeah. So you've been in it. So you're, you're basically an OG at this point going back to, you know, $12 Bitcoin prices. Yeah. Yeah. I've been around for a long time. And, and the first thing I did as I started um, investing in trading and back in the day, there used to be these um, Bitcoin based assets called, they were like stocks that mm -hmm. would trade for Bitcoin. So you'd take your Bitcoin, you would buy a share in somebody's mining operation, and then they would pay you dividends for all of the people that owned a portion of those stocks. And they had these little sites. In it. So what I did is I built a high frequency trading algorithm because I wasn't interested in holding the stocks because the difficulty kept increasing and whatever you had, you were lucky to get back and, and tons of people exit scammed. But what I did is I would buy, there was a massive spread and I would buy them low and sell them high and I had it automated so that I was always on the inside of the trade. Nice. And we made, you know, 0.2 Bitcoins a day, so, you know, for, for a couple, quite a few months. We did, we did pretty decent on <laughs> messing around with it. And just over the years, we, we, we make money and then we get knocked down like MT Gox bankruptcy knocked us down pretty good. And then we got back up and made money and traded and then Cripsy knocked us down pretty good. And I was almost liquidated from Cripsy. <laughs> wow. But we got back in and got things going. And just having gone through those bumps and bruises and understanding firsthand what it feels like to have a wallet drained or have, have uh, you know, trusting a, a, a centralized authority and then having it blow up in your face, that kind of thing, it really taught me a lot and helped me understand what users need, especially newbies to the, to the industry. Well, it definitely so shows me that you have some uh, persistence and tenacity to <laughs> stay with it through all those ups and downs. And, and that really will make you a crypto OG in like, oh, I don't know, like crypto years. That's like 200 years or something, I think. Oh, I know. But it makes you a believer. It makes it, you know, going through all of that and staying in it, it, le it makes you know that I'm sold on. Like, I can see the future of this thing. And I, I believe it. Uh, you know what? I, I was a, a hard sell myself. Um, you know, I think two years ago, I was still saying Bitcoin's a scam. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but and, and why I did that or thought that way is because some of the, a lot of the stuff that people were out there promoting it. I think Bitcoin promoters are some of the worst people for promoting cryptocurrencies <laughs> they're like their own worst enemy um but you know a lot of the stuff we're saying is it's all anonymous and like the blockchain's open how are you saying it's anonymous right. um and, and then people would say things you know oh, there's always these guys in their mom's basement of course and then you yeah. know um and, and i i have this rule like if you're going to give investment advice talk to me about that you have some stocks, bonds, mutual funds, some real estate, and, and then maybe I'll start listening to you. But the problem with so many crypto investors is they have zero assets in any other place. Yeah. Zero experience trading okay. other investments. And they're not startup entrepreneurs, a lot of them. Now, I'm not saying it's, it's all that way, but a couple of years ago, it was that way. You know, it oh, was the, you know. Well, the, even in 2017, it was major. I mean, in the big ramp up, Everybody was an expert. Everyone started their own YouTube video streaming thing and everyone was giving investment advice to everyone. It right. was it was insane. Like, and a I lot of it like, was and a lot of it was bad advice, you know, and, and I could get on the, the whole do your own research and I think we're gonna do a show on how do your own research is such this really horrible mantra or read the white paper is as from an investment standpoint, it's just awful advice because it's not enough information that I don't believe it's enough information um, to actually make a good investment decision. Right. Um, can't mitigate risk based on a white paper. And, you know, it's really funny because people are investing a lot more money in uh, like the ICO hype um, with less information than an angel investor would have, you know, just from reading a white paper. You know, I like business plans. Maybe I'm an old fart, but business plans tell me a couple things. It really tells me a lot about the management team, mm -hmm. you know, um, angel investors and VCs do things like background checks, credit checks, you know, they go through and, you know, look at what you've done previously, you know, yeah. have you actually run a company before, managed a budget, things like that. You know, uh, a business plan actually has financial statements in it. Yeah. Um, 
And so, and to me, and, and a marketing plan and, and all these things. And I know, I, and I see all these early, at least 2017, even late 2016, all these crypto investors, these guys don't know anything about any of that stuff out there, given other people who know even less you know, advice about investing. And that's why, you know, the crypto market, you know, there's about $600 billion in, in market drop from the beginning of the year. And I yeah. think that's where a lot of that money went, unfortunately, into bad, bad investments. Yeah. Um, but I am really, really bullish on crypto myself. So I think this is just a really good time. So uh, anyways, I'm digressing here, but I wanted to talk a little bit about, so Coinbook, you know, why does the world need another exchange? There's hundreds of exchanges popping up every day now all over the planet. Everybody's got a DEX. Everybody's got a, you know, a centralized exchange. Why did you decide to do another exchange? What's different about Coinbook? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And I think you actually alluded to the answer a little bit earlier. You're like, you know, there've been so many hacks. There've been so much, there's a lot of mistrust. Like it's hard to move your money to an exchange because and, and I know that I got burned on empty gox and curtsy before I learned my lesson. I had to get burned twice before I learned that lesson. Uh, finally, you learned. <laughs> exactly. So here's, here's why Coinbook was invented. In the run up of 2017, I recognized that there was only one or two major players that actually trade against the dollar. There are, th there are tons of exchanges out there but a lot of them are all crypto based. You can only transfer Bitcoin in, you can only trans trade crypto to crypto and those things spring up, they're a dime a dozen. So are you talking about tethers and stable coins or, or what are you talking about trade against the dollar? So say I don't know anything about crypto trading. What yeah, is that? So, so what I'm saying is that there are exchanges that they, you can only trade crypto to crypto, meaning if you wanna trade on their exchange, you have to buy Bitcoin from the only two places out there at the time, which was Coinbase and Gemini. So you had to get an account, you had to buy Bitcoin with your dollars there, and then you could move your Bitcoin from that exchange over to any number of 25 to 50 little small mom and pop exchanges that they're just sort of providing the same service. It's sort of clone, clone right. service. Each other. Well, where's the pain point in that? You have getting your money in it's getting dollars into bitcoin and that is the pain point and so recognizing that there is an issue where there's too few options not enough competition there was a lot of customer service problems uh, with these exchanges and um, one other major problem was that these exchanges were creating a lot of confusion in the industry there was the whole split between bitcoin and bitcoin cash and offering those and supporting one and then supporting the other. And then with the marketing on Bitcoin Cash saying that they're Bitcoin, there were a lot of confused investors and newbies were like, how, like, what am I doing? Do I buy the cheap Bitcoin or the expensive Bitcoin? And there was, it was just not clear. And there was no one there to help them because if anyone had a problem, it was a five day wait on a support ticket if you were lucky, you know, or, or an unresponse. And so um, what, what I noticed is, is it was a shift away from the institutional or the a shift from the retail investor to the institutional investor that they were starting to cater Wall Street. They were starting to try to get bigger and bigger invest investors, which everyone got excited about because big money increases prices and things like that. But right. I'll kind of look at People think it makes it more legitimate too, right? Yeah, it makes it look legitimate. But the problem is, who's servicing the little guy? The guy that doesn't really understand Bitcoin. They're getting mixed messages and not much response because these guys are trying to get out there and make the big money. Or they're in bed with um, manipulators trying to sell coins that, you know, that who knows if there's a future there. There was a tons of hype scams and all kinds of things. And um, me and, and the guy that introduced me to Bitcoin, Nate Davis, we became partners and we started this exchange and we've been working on it for an entire year. We just barely went live on the, um, the 31st, which was the 10 year anniversary of the Bitcoin white paper. Nice launch date. I know. 
everyone was like, oh, they've chosen Halloween for their launch date. I'm like, it's not Halloween. <laughs> There's nothing to do with Halloween. <laughs> so anyway. Um, so so, so, your, so your focus has been, so, you, so your focus is trying to deal with, you know, onboarding, you know, more of the newbie investor. Yeah, we want a place where, where somebody won't get confused information. Like we are so sold on the philosophy of decentralization that we look at our exchange as a necessary evil. Like we are centralized, we are a company. But the thing is, is you have to go from dollars to Bitcoin somehow. And so do you wanna go through a company that's, that's kind of muddied the waters and confused people and isn't really there to help you out? Or do you wanna go through a, a company that has a lot of customer service, that makes it approachable, that has a phone number for crying out loud, that, that kind of does things in a way that, that helps people understand what's going on so that they can kind of learn it the right way. And one so, thing- So right now then, so your exchange is live. And so people can send you actual, so you can actually buy through your exchange, you can send crypto now or cash to buy crypto through Coinbook. Yes. Wonderful. So we are, we're in the process of doing some validation. We have a lot of users that have signed up already and we're working them through um, verification and all of that. And uh, we haven't had our first trade yet since it takes a few days to get everything verified. The but, ANL, KYC kind of thing. Yeah. And what's cool about it, and this is um, just maybe a, a little bit of an aside, but um, we don't store any of your information. We ask for your personal information, but it is, it is a pass through directly to the bank. So if you go to a, you, so you're in the United States and you want to open a bank account, you have right. to show up to the bank account with, or you show up to the bank, you show them your proof of residency, you show them your driver's license, they type, type, type. You have to give them their social security number. You have to do all these things just to get a bank account in the United States. Right. Well, so Coinbook has set it up to where all that data is directly passed through. We don't store any of it. It passes directly to them. They are in charge of the, of the storage and the housing of all of that. And the bank account you have with Coinbook is your bank account. It's essentially you've opened a checking account at our site and it's in your control. So we've almost decentralized it in a certain way because if something happened to Coinbook, your account is still exists with Evolve Bank. <laughs> you wow. have that bank account. So there's no, there's no ownership at, of Coinbook there. We just have visibility into your balance so that we can validate that you have the funds to make trades. Well, that's pretty awesome. So that's actually, so that's pretty unique they, from my understanding. So you're, you're not, you know, taking, you're not like taking possession of the, you know, you're not doing the custodial act, at least on the, the fiat piece. Right. And what did we give up? If we held all your money, we could earn interest on all of those dollars, which is sizable. You know what I mean? We, we are giving up that part of, of the business because we believe in um, decentralization and we're going to do it as best we can. I mean, we, we can't be completely decentralized, but we can limit the exposure and we are going to do that as a company. Well, it's a, well, it's one less failure point then from like a hacking standpoint, like, you know, you know, you mentioned a couple different, you know, major players that do, you know, exchanges that do fiat and I have accounts at some of those myself. Um, so you've taken that, that piece away and, and let's just be honest, banks have really, for the most part, banks have really good security, you know? Right. And so, you know, you can actually trust that the bank is doing their job. Um, yeah. A lot of these exchanges don't have bank level security, regardless of what they say. They're secure. They get hacked all the time. Right. Um, and so, I mean, that's, I think, a really good security um, piece there. So, you know, your, your system, you know, is actually pretty safe that way. And Absolutely. I think that from a newbie standpoint, you know, that you hear about all these scams out in crypto world. You know, I talk to a lot of people that are, you know, a lot of no coiners out there and, and security and, and worried about being scammed is a real concern a lot of people have, especially people that haven't looked into it. Um, and they're, they're, they're right in many respects, you know. Mm -hmm. The amount of scammers in the crypto industry right now are, you know, it's immense. I mean, even as a project, you wouldn't believe how many times people have tried to fish us, you know, so far. Yeah. I would say we've been, people have tried to fish us about a half dozen times and some of them are really good. Like 
uh-huh. didn't fall for it, but got really close. You know, we, we always do our diligence too. Um, but it's amazing, you know, how good these scammers are. So I, I can understand why the average, you know, person out there who is interested in crypto, but is hesitating getting involved is put off by the, the perception of things being insecure. So I think what you're doing with Coinbook, you know, that would make me feel a lot more secure because I'd much, you know, and, and people are going to haze me for this, but it is what it is. <laughs> uh, I, at this point, still have more confidence in banks keeping my funds secure and banks, by the way, have insurance, um, mm-hmm. the average exchange out there right now. Because if, uh, if an exchange loses my cash or my crypto, I have no recourse at this point. Whereas, you know, a bank does. Because if, you're, if the bank gets hacked, they're FDIC insured, right? Yeah. And, so, that, and so your funds are FDIC insured at Coinbook, your USD. So um, that's one thing I was going to mention to you is that as far as credibility goes, do you trust the, the exchange that only trades crypto to crypto? Well, crypto, if you don't hold the keys to your wallet, you don't hold the, those coins. And everyone in Bitcoin will preach this to you. Well, we, we, have to hold coin, we have to hold the keys for any Bitcoin that are on Coinbook, but we're also um, tied in with the banks. Being tied in with the banks makes, you, makes it sound, you know, from, from the hardcore crypto person that's been around, they're like, oh, so, banks uh, are evil. <laughs> banks are evil. We, you know, you don't work with banks. That's, that's the opposite, you know, of things you need to do. But guess right. what? Because we have to comply with the banking laws in the United States, we're, we're not some dude in a basement that, that created this crypto exchange so they can stay anonymous and mess around with things. And hey, can you you're insulting us guys in our basement now? <laughs> but, so, but having to go through the due diligence and be qualified for a bank account and a and, and U.S. exchange is absolutely difficult. Can I just say that it took us the better part of the entire year that we've been in startup phase was getting the bank to, to agree to, to use us and compliance. and compliance and making sure we've crossed all the T's. Uh, our, our lawyers worked really hard just to find us a, a match to where they would, that they would let us even do an exchange. Well, you know, when I, when I began, you know, this last year, we started our project, you know, Sorry. We, you know, um, we ended up, you know, looking at all the compliance issues and in one sense, yeah, it, a lot of it is burdensome and redundant, and I would argue a lot of regulations are just straight up overreach. But on the other hand, if someone has gone through at least all those those checks, all those verifications, you know, to go through and, and get approvals to do these things, I have, you know, at least some faith that one, the startup at least cares about those things, uh-huh. you know. Think of it this way. There's a lot of startups and, and, and you've run into these guys too. Well, you know, we've gone to a lot of the same conferences and stuff. You know, mm-hmm. these guys that are like, I don't, I'm not a security. I'm a utility token and screw the man. And they come mm-hmm. after me if they want and I'm not paying my taxes. And that's great. But the minute, uh, you know, one of the things that, that I hear is, uh, you know, someone who has done some investing and done a lot in the startup world is the minute, I hear a startup entrepreneur talking about just disregarding and scoffing at regulations or regulatory compliance out of the gate. It's a tremendous, huge red flag for me because compliance can shut down a project, you know, and, and could, you know, you're in, in some of these things, you know, a lot of people don't understand, especially the hardcore crypto people that the AML KYC stuff comes out of the Patriot Act. Right. This is the stuff that they send people to Gitmo in Guantanamo Bay for. <laughs> so, you know, if you don't comply, this isn't just a civil thing, right? Like, oh, I'll get fined and I'll, I'll deal with it. This is stuff they can put you away criminally for if you don't comply with them. And, yeah. and so I like to point out that if anytime you hear some kind of crypto entrepreneur basically just thumbing their, their middle finger at the, the regulatory piece, as much as I don't like it, um, you know, I would run from those people because I think they're going to get in trouble or get shut down at some point. And, you know, and it's not even a moral judgment, right? Like, I mean, some people would call me a sellout, but the fact is if there's a high likelihood that you're not going to be able to continue with your project, then there's no point in, you know, trying to invest in that project longer. Absolutely. 
that is that is investment risk. You're you're you are signing on and giving money to a project that can be closed down. Right. I mean, how why why would you expose yourself to to that additional risk? Well, not only the project closed down, but the founder being put in jail. I mean, so I mean that's like kind of like your investment. That's investment. Yeah. And, and, and so when I, so if I hear anytime I hear an entrepreneur and, and I've gone to some big conferences in the crypto world and, and I like to grill, you know, the average guy doing an ICO raise. And I just kind of want to look at, you know, some of the basic kind of, you know, startup kind of concerns. You know, I like to understand at least if I'm going to invest in something or invest in a project, you're investing in the people more than anything. And if those people, one, don't seem to have a good grasp on the potential downsides or the potential risk of their own project, or they are deliberately thumbing their nose at it, um, run from those people because you're, they're going to get in trouble and they're going to lose you your money. Um, and, and I like to start there. So, um, so, so you're going to be doing fiat, which is, you know, we need I, I believe we need more fiat to crypto exchanges. So that's one of the things I'm excited about Coinbook for. So mm -hmm. say I'm an investor. I, I want to send you some money. I like the idea that your bank accounts are, you know, you're not doing the, you're not taking custody of people's fiat. So what kind of crypto can I buy through Coinbook? So we went live with just Bitcoin. And the reason we did that is because um, we, we needed the, the asset with the most, um, kind of the most tools from an exchange standpoint. There's a lot that goes into uh, security and wallets, and having everything completely vetted on Bitcoin was was really helpful. So we're going to go live with uh, Bitcoin, trade that for um, a couple of weeks to a month until we're through kind of the growing pains. We're still, you know, getting used to the volume and getting used to. Uh, support support tickets and figuring out where our weak points are and that kind of thing and and I mean this is v1 I'll just be straight up honest with you this is our this is our first version we have we have tons of improvements and things that are coming down the pipeline but um, we needed to get a functioning processing exchange out the door and that's exactly what this is once we're once we're comfortable with everything and we're able to scale the way we need to then we're going to add a couple of new coins that um, aren't currently traded. Some are. So right now you can trade um, Litecoin. That one's one that we will be adding. But nice. three, three that we have not, that you can't buy with dollar right now is Digibyte, uh, Feathercoin, and Bullion. And these are, these are communities. So I'll tell you why we chose those coins. Okay. Um, especially in 2017, people were like, hey, we just released a, a white paper. Um, everyone get excited. We just got listed on Binance. Now, now our coin went up 1,000% or 100,000%, or <laughs> like 1,000 times it went up. Right. And, and everyone got so excited. And then everyone put all their money in near the top. And then, then they had their first, first miss of a deadline or or, or people just cashed out. I mean, who wouldn't sell an investment that went up to 100, 100 times, you know? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so people just market forces and people just get nailed. So what we decided is that because we are setting up an exchange centered on helping people new to the industry and people that are, we're kind of thinking that our users may not be as savvy as the average typical Bitcoin OG that's been around for so long, right? right. <laughs> Your word. <laughs> and, and so we want to, to put protections in place, not only from a security standpoint, but from a coin choice standpoint. We don't want to add coins where our friends and, and people that we care about go to our website at coinbook.com and and buy a coin that plummets and loses 90% of its value. I mean, these coins will do this all by themselves, but we are looking for coins that have already gone through the hype cycle. They've already gone through that massive run up when they were first introduced and all the excited people that got on board. And then a year later, and then two years later, it kind of hits this trough and people are wondering, will this survive and that kind of thing. Well, Litecoin is five years old. You know, Digibyte is five years old. Uh, Feathercoin was the eighth 
cryptocurrency invented. And bullion is one of those really old coins as well. And we chose these particular coins because um, they have communities that have supported us. And um, we want to, you know, we want to help those that have kind of helped us get, get to where we are, but are, but are also safe investments. My grandma can go and buy a Digibyte and it, it's not going to move that much. I mean, it'll go up and down, you know, the, jet, the average 20% here and there. <laughs> but right. she has a way better shot at making money on a coin that's already stabilized, that has some, some future built into it than, than she would just jump it on the, the next hype train. Yeah, and and I don't disagree. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. And I, and I mean, you look at a lot of these ICO projects. Um, you know, a lot of them are turned out to be straight up scams. You know, uh-huh. you know, there's that. But then, a lot of these projects that you know, even a lot of ones I've invested in. And now I have like dozens of investments and in You know, lots of you know different coins and projects in mm-hmm. myself. So it's like I follow lots of different projects out there, and it's it's interesting to see that how many of them you know, are not even delivering what they promise. I mean, and some of these did tremendous raises, you know, outside, you know, in the, in the angel and venture capital world, these, these companies or these coins, if they were just a typical investment would never have made the raises they made through traditional raises, but you know, they did these hit hyped ICOs and the amount of resources these products raised were insane. Uh, I know yeah, with all hard. those, three, you know, I, I look at, you know, it's funny cause I look at some of these projects and they're just not delivering on anything. And I'm like, you know, if you would have just sold that and bought real estate, you still would have been having a much better return, you know, <laughs> they would have just taken their ICO money and invested it in like mutual funds, you know, yeah. they would have actually made a much better project. And I've always wondered like why some of these projects don't actually sell off a lot of their crypto and invest and diversify into other projects or oh. investments. You know, I, I know it's scary, and I think that's part of why Ethereum has struggled because all these ICOs they wanted they wanted Ethereum and they wanted Ethereum to raise their money and their capital, and they held Ethereum, and then now they need to pay for business expenses and they need to they need to hire their team they need to like they haven't you know they they need that money. Well, right. they're selling Ethereum, no matter what the price is, and all right. that Ethereum was donated to them, so they don't have their entrance costs for that was zero. Anything above zero which is, which, is profit to them. Right. And so what, do do, what, what kind of market forces are, are those? But, but here, here the problem is, is that you don't, it, you have to, you have to account for that tax regardless. And this is the thing that people don't understand about the crypto tax world, that if someone invested in you, the minute you basically are double taxed because the minute you, you know, got that money invested in you, you have to treat that like income. And even if you don't liquidate the crypto that you raised for your project, you still have to pay tax on that basis of zero um, at the time you got it. So here's the problem. If people did an ICO at the hype and when Ethereum was $700, they now have to pay tax on $700 worth of Ethereum when Ethereum is only trading at below $200. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. Is like seven, and until they cash out, that's, the, that, that's their tax. If they sell at 200, they can record that loss, right. but it's not gonna offset the, the 700, and they would have to sell it all to even mark down the loss. So there's, right. an, there, there's a tax incentive for them to continue to sell off Ethereum, it's rough. Yeah, and and this is what I think going forward, and even with our own project with Tusk and, and OCC, is that, you know, we didn't have to deal with any of that <laughs> because we didn't do an ICO, we didn't do any kind of raise like that. So, I think um, a lot of the smaller projects like ours over the next year, I, I this is my prediction with crypto. I think what's going to end up happening is that you know between all the legal ICOs, you know, having enforcement actions, you know, against them, mm-hmm. um, and all the projects not delivering what they said they would. And I don't think they're all scams, but I think just, you know, just normal business forces, right? People aren't, yeah. doesn't, just because you have a good idea doesn't mean you can execute. doesn't mean that you can manage the team and mod- manage the project. And sometimes the technology just doesn't work. A lot of these ICOs were for theories, right? Theoretical things. We're going to try to make it work. And sometimes they just can't get it to work. Yeah. And I think over the next year, this is what I, this is what I think. I think 2019 is going to be pretty flat. 
you know, in the crypto realm. You know, I could be completely wrong. Maybe it's going to go bonkers, but I think there's going to be a lot of attrition um, in, in crypto where I think a lot of garbage is going to need to get flushed out. And I think 2020 is probably going to be a big year because I think, you know, end of this year and the rest of the next year, I think there's just going to be a lot of uncertainty in the markets with SEC enforcement. I mean, the SEC has got like 2000 cases right now. Um, active yeah. investigations on, you know, enforcement actions in crypto. So that should tell you something, right? And and they're yeah. pokey, you know, just because you haven't been subpoenaed doesn't mean you're not going to be. Um, yeah. And I think with with all that enforcement and still some of the gray areas about, or at least the uncertainty you know, or regulations, and I think it just takes some time, right? If you did a raise it last year, maybe your mile, your white paper or your roadmap says you're not going to actually deliver your project till second quarter 2019, right? Well, Let's just wait till what happens in second quarter 2019 and see if you delivered it. And I think a lot of those projects aren't going to deliver what they say for a lot of reasons. Um, and I think so. It'll be interesting to see what happens in 2019 um, yeah. in the crypto well, space. I mean, I, I, I don't know what will happen in 2019, but I agree with you on 2020 because that's when the next Bitcoin happening will be. And there's going to be a lot of hype and a lot of excitement. I, I agree that I think 2020 will be one of those another monster pump years. Um, next year, I'm not quite so sure. But I mean, to add to the complications of these businesses, these ICOs, they, they publish, hey, we, we raised $100 million. They told yeah, everybody. That, that was at a $1,500 Ethereum. And they raised it all in Ethereum. And so people are like, you know, now, they're, now their entire raise is worth $15 million or $20 million, And they're like, how come you haven't delivered on, on our project yet? And they're kind of like, well... You know, you have a hundred million dollars to work with. No, they don't. Nope. They have they have much less than that, and they're they may be wondering how they pay the tax bill. Use those resources, and how they're going to pay their tax bill. I mean, let's just be honest about it, right? You did. Yeah. You still have to pay the tax on that raise. Uh -huh. um, and yeah, I, and you know, it'll be interesting to see how many major ICOs are actually from at least American ICOs are actually insolvent. And, yeah. and I, yeah, and that could be pretty scary. And trust me, I got a lot of money tied up in crypto investments outside my own project. So, you know, yeah. there's a few that I'm like, wow, I hope it comes back. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, I, well, you, you know, know what? I think we'll be surprised. Everything in my mind is tied to Bitcoin. And it's because of these exchanges. There are so many exchanges that are tied to Bitcoin or to Ethereum. But the price of Bitcoin drives the rest of the market. It's what drives hype. It's, it's what drives new entrants. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of, lot of, Bitcoin can be a catalyst for a lot of things. If Bitcoin turns around and has another, you know, it, it restores confidence. People get excited. People start FOMOing back in. Guess what happens to all these ICOs? They're going to come along with it. They're, they're, people are getting well. A lot of projects that will absolutely, that you might think they're dead now and they'll completely turn around as long as they have the operational skills to keep things going until then. <laughs> well, that's why we don't have a burn rate. So it works out. And that's what I like. about Like, you know, it's funny because when we started our project originally, we were actually more centralized, but we've, you know, subsequently turned more into a community project. Now we've, you know, tripled the size of our team and it's everybody just kind of, no one's getting paid. Everybody's just kind of working for the project now, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, believe in the concept. So, you know, I, I definitely believe that a community based, more decentralized model actually keeps the burn rate down. And, and I believe that people who are more passionate about the project and the mission are going to stick around longer versus the ICOs. I mean, what happens if the ICO has a hard time, you know, paying it to developers? Do the developers just walk? You know, I mean, it, what, what does that do long term? Because if you, they have these crazy, you know, raises, I remember the dot com boom too, right? I, I was a grown up through the, the dot com crash. And, yeah. you know, you would see the first thing these people do is just they, they buy these lavish, they get these big raises from VCs and they just spend the money on ludicrous stuff, massive office space things, you know, crazy expensive desks, thousand dollar a round chairs and, you know, all these things they don't need to run their business. And I'm like, where's the guy going and getting the folding tables from Walmart? Because really that's where you, you oh. should be starting, right? Is oh. like, be frugal with that money, you know, to me. Well, you nailed You nailed it. Honestly. That is one of the things that you have to be aware of when people are raising money through an ICO. And it is hard for a company to say, 
you know, you get an ICO, they have a ma major raise. They're like, we're going to show off that we're amazing. And they buy their Lamborghinis and show up to the conferences. Yep. So let me just tell you um, that Coinbook did not ICO on purpose. And the reason was you because we, yeah, I don't want a Lambo. That would be horrible. <laughs> it's because we want, I mean, it, it, it is a, you know, we're talking about trust and how, how do you trust an exchange? Well, do you, do you trust an exchange that um, is working on, on money that they have no, that they have, they don't behold themselves to anybody, you know, their, their money was deposited through ICO. There's, there's no re there's very little recourse, that kind of there's, thing. There's no equity, you know, I mean, yeah. Yeah. so to me, when, when I see, when I see a guy show up, in, you know, an entrepreneur show up in a Lamborghini, that just shows me how many ads they're not buying to promote the project. Yeah, absolutely. So Coinbook, we've raised funds um, just traditionally. And why? Well, as the CEO, you know, I'm, I'm building a company that I want to exceed and to succeed, and I'm on the hook for it. I've invested my own money into this project and yeah, we are buying folding tables <laughs> and chairs. Not really. I've got a, I got a nice chair. Had had to, had to get, you know, had to get some basics, you know. Yeah, that's but a I'm nice. Playing. That's a rock and pleather, man. <laughs> um, so tell me about you know some of the things you're doing with achievements. What are, what are some of the things that what are some of the interesting features you would have with Coinbook? And and then maybe we can segue into what do you want? You said earlier that you're you got more versions coming. Tell yeah. me kind of the things that make you different and and where you're going to be in the future. Well, so this is what's what's cool about I think modern businesses are starting to realize that um, it's an old fashioned thing to be stuffy, you know. And people have kind of figured it out. And, I, and, I, and I'm not a fan of Facebook, but Mark Zuckerberg was the first guy to wear a hoodie to any Wall Street conventions or whatever. He was, he was a big guy and everyone was like, what is happening? Why isn't he in a suit? You know what I mean? <laughs> and, and the world has followed that lead. Over the past 20 years, things have changed. Businesses are more casual. They are, they're trying to get more comfortable, you know, to, to kind of the average guy. And that's, that's what I'm trying to do. So we created achievements to kind of say, you know, to kind of pull people away from, from the, the same old, same old. Every other exchange is a cookie cutter of every other exchange. Right, they're pretty similar. They, they essentially create um, a very, very professional, very, and, and it's not bad to be professional, but we've created achievements purely for entertainment purposes. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> so I log on, I hear the word achievement. What does it mean? Is it is this like a gamification thing? It's absolutely a gamification. Like, like, am, I the, am I the king of coin book? Like if I log in so many <laughs> times or what is it? Yeah, so it's kind of a w way of rewarding but keeping things interesting. So for example, um, when you log in um, and your, day, your account's one day old, so you haven't even done anything, you've just registered. You log back in tomorrow and you've got an achievement and they'll tell you, you know, that, hey, it feels like you've been around, um, it's like, Ten minutes. it seems like almost, almost yesterday since you were a part of our family and it's like, oh, right, it was, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and we, kind of, we kind of mess around with people and throw people a little off balance and it's, and so part of it is a little bit to kind of break up the monotony and kind of uh, tailor to millennials and people that you know, why, why shouldn't it be fun to do things, you know, to interact with a business as well? And I think businesses that have figured out that in their marketing, you know, there've been some Wendy's campaigns that are like, you know, fighting other companies in just a hilarious way. And it's, it's great. I think it's all good fun. And that's kind of the basis of this is to kind of be a little more real and a little more, more fun. And it's kind of our own slice on, on, the, uh, on the idea of an exchange. But we also include rewards. So We'll, we'll give you five bucks for doing five trades. And we'll, you know, if, if you do certain things on the site, we'll end up sending you a t-shirt. And, you know, we know we're going to offend some people. But on the whole, we're just doing it in good, in good fun. You I'm know still, what I I'm mean? still waiting on my t-shirt, by the way. So. <laughs> hey, you got to get on there and earn that t-shirt. <laughs> 
Um, so in the future, what do you, what kind of features do you, you know, plan to introduce, you know, as time goes on? I know you're kind of doing your shakeout period right now and, you know, yeah. you're still early on, but what kind of things, what else are you going to add to the, the platform? So um, we have some, so right now, now um, we're working through um, getting a payment processor and some things like that um, in place. We've been kind of focused on the exchange itself, but we're going to add a store to our to our site where people can buy hardware wallets. That's one thing that we've pushed. We every convention and everything that we go to, we're always handing out treasures and giving things away, and because we want people to to get educated and store their coins themselves. Coinbook was not invented to be another bank and another place to house your crypto. We want you to buy your crypto, get a hardware wallet, and put it on your site. And we're practically we're we're going to be selling these for near cost. I mean, we're just we're essentially doing our customers a favor by teaching you how to hold your own coins and keeping them yourself. And then we're going to add fun stuff. You know, I mean, me and me and me and my uh, the people I talk to, we kind of have a weird sense of humor, but. We're gonna we're gonna come up with some swag and some funny things like an eight ball for how to trade Bitcoin or just just funny things you know so we're gonna we're gonna add some stuff like that and um, but then there are also business st strategic things that we want to add we're gonna um, we're right now only individuals can trade on Coinbook so we are going to let um, small businesses set up accounts. We're not interested in large invest investors like institutional investors yet. I mean, I don't even see that happening on Coinbook. If we were to tackle that, it would be a completely separate entity with completely different marketing and everything. Because this Coinbook needs to be a place for the small, for the little guy. And small businesses struggle because they'll get paid in Bitcoin. And it's hard to get to dollars. It's really hard. And, um, and the problem is, is that a lot of these, a lot of these Bitcoin companies, they have a hard time getting a bank account. And then if you you mix your personal, so like you get Bitcoin on your personal and you sell it through your personal, it's hard to track that and keep your LLC separate from your personal and everything Here's else. Your prevail and yeah, and, a lot of problems. And, yeah, and yeah, and 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 this goes back to just you know on. Ultimately, you know, we got to go back to, you know, basic, you know, small business on, you know, fundamentals. And a yeah. lot of people that are into crypto don't understand that, you know. Yes. And so there's like this huge learning curve. So, so, you know, I do appreciate you coming on the show today. Um, where can people find out more about Coinbook? Yeah, I mean, the site's coinbook.com and you can, there's an about us and contact page there. Um, the phone number's there. Um, it's 385-247 coin, uh, pretty, pretty straightforward. And, um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're handling support tickets. We're going to help you get verified. Um, we're expecting the first trades to happen, um, early next week. Once, once we get through things, our, our verification should be instant. Um, just this startup section here, we're, we're a little bit slow, but we're getting through it and it's going to be amazing. Well, Calvin, thank you so much. And I wish you uh, all the luck in the world and uh, keep the good fight going. Absolutely, Rob. I appreciate you um, having me on. You're, you're a good guy. You're a good guy. So <laughs> you're, <laughs> I support what you do. And I think, I think you've got a great philosophy. So, Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening to the Rob McNeely program. Make sure you check us out on the web at robmcneely.com and subscribe to our podcast at YouTube, iTunes, and on the Google Play Store.